Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are in a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grillin' JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? I'm good, Connie. I'm in Oklahoma, as you can probably see in my little office here and surrounded by memorabilia and things of that nature, things that I like, including Fiji water. They should be a sponsor. I drink a ton of, I, I, I'm going through Fiji water like it was bourbon. It's good stuff. Good for you. We're excited to be here today. We're talking WrestleMania. Of course, WrestleMania is right around the corner. We hope you guys, first of all, enjoyed AEW Dynamite last night, where you can still hear the voice of wrestling each and every Wednesday. But this week is uh, WrestleMania season, boy, and everybody's talking about it. Of course, tomorrow, The Undertaker goes into the Hall of Fame. Pretty well deserved. I'm sure you can't argue that, Jim. No, hell no. He's Clint Eastwood, man. He's He is uh, special. And his, his legacy at WWE will never be topped. You know, he's, he's a extraordinary human, extraordinary talent, his longevity for a guy, his size to have that kind of longevity and still be productive athletically is, uh, nothing short of extraordinary to me. So yeah, he's, is any, who, uh, he and Vader going in anybody else that they've announced? You know, I'm not sure. Uh, I know for sure that Charmel's going, but yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I'm excited Vader's going, but I think everybody's still talking about, you know, what to expect with uh, the Undertaker because Vince McMahon is going to be the guy to induct him. So, not mm -hmm. something we've seen a ton of. I think all they've announced so far though is Undertaker, uh, Vader, uh, Queen Charmel, and uh, uh, Shad, who's going to be getting the the Dana Warrior yeah. Award. Yeah. Well, I'm glad Shad's getting not forgotten. That's good. You know, he was a decent guy. I enjoyed he and the, was it JTG? Yep. Had their, had their tag team, fun guys to be around. He deserves to be remembered and, uh, I'm glad they're doing it. So good, good for them. So I, I there's so much going on, man. I've been basketball overload too. I got to tell you, I think everybody is. Yeah. I'm a big, I'm a sports fan. That's why I've invested in it, but I find myself falling asleep, you know, uh, and then waking up for the last three or four minutes of a game, which seems to be the story being told. It's like the NBA, you know, the fourth quarter is about the only thing that's worth the shit. Uh, cause they don't play defenses. So they get out of the seemingly till the near the end of the game, but I'm kind of basketball, uh, I'm basketballed out, I think. And like you were, you and I were talking for one of the air, there's so many conflicts and time issues all these activities going on in, uh, in, uh, Dallas affiliated with WrestleMania in a loose way, unofficial way is, uh, I think going to be problematic. There's only so many dollars to go around. There's only so many places you can be at one time. And I, I, you told me how many events are going to be going on at Friday at not Friday night at seven in Dallas. It was extraordinary. I was shocked to hear that number. It was like, whatever it was, you told me it was ridiculous. So we'll see I, I, the guy, 
And the guy not only does a good job at uh, Russell at uh, WrestleCon. Oh yeah, Michael Bakiki, a friend of the show. I'm sure he will. Yeah, and he's done, you know, he's done right by me more than one time. So I'm I'm pulling for him, but I just uh, hope that there's enough cash to go around and people want to get out there and and, uh, and support those efforts. It supports the wrestlers too, by the way. So yeah, it's not just the promoters. You're taking care of the talent who entertain us and. Uh, to me, I think one of the big main events of the weekend is Super Show Live. It happens this Friday, which is tomorrow. Make plans to join myself, Jeff Jarrett, Eric Bischoff, William Regal, and of course, Jeff Hardy. We're going to be at Gillies. We're doing a VIP meet and greet at five o'clock. The show will start at seven. Tickets are available now at supershowlive.com. Gillies is world famous, man. And the idea that we're putting live mics and William Regal and Jeff Hardy's hands, this should be pretty fun. Yeah, good. You got a good crew there. Regal's uh Regal's been a perfect fit, I think, coming into AEW. Absolutely. And he's been he's a he's excellent on commentary, he's excellent with his promos, uh, and in the behind the scenes, uh tutoring a lot of these kids. You know, he's still in the head of uh of Moxley and uh uh Brian Danielson. Uh, he still helps them. So he's uh, very active. He's a, he's, I think he's a va- valuable addition to what we're doing. And then, you know, you got Jeff coming back. Uh, that's going to be cool. So you, you, your audience is going to have a very eclectic group of people to chat with and to hear from and to ask questions of. So it should be fun. Hope you do get, you guys do kill it on uh, Friday night and, uh, have fun. You know, I, I'd encourage all the fans to check that out. Hell, that'll be probably the most fun show of the, of the weekend. Got big surprises planned as well. Make plans to join us. Supershowlive.com is where you can pick up your tickets. If for some reason you can't make it to Dallas, no big deal. Pre-order the pay-per-view on fight. Uh, the rumor is with a pre-order, you get a Jeff Hardy trading card. I don't think Jeff has had a trading card, uh, outside of WWE or TNA. So this is going to be super collectible. You get that when you pre-order at supershowlive.com. And if you're looking to know, Hey, when's Jr. hitting the road again? Well, you're in luck within the next 30 days. He's going to be going across the pond for the love of wrestling. It's April 23rd or 24th. Uh, I'm pretty excited to see what they're doing over there, man. It feels like they've got a whole host of talent, new age outlaws or Kurt angle. It's like a who's who over there. And right at the top of the list, good old Jr. Well, thanks. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I'm flying over there after we do Pittsburgh, uh, dynamite. Then I hit the road the next day to start venturing that direction. Uh, I think Trish and Lita are going to be there. Tori Wilson's going to be there. Uh, the Steiners I heard were going to be our book. Bray Wyatt, JBL, Tugboat, yeah. Mickey James on and on and on for the love of wrestling is what you want to look for. Uh, you can find them uh, online or on Twitter for the love of wrestling.co.uk or on Twitter at FTLO wrestling and get more information about Jim coming across the pond. But this topic we're talking about today, WrestleMania 23. Yes. We're going to talk about the show itself, Yeah, but maybe the most exciting part of the weekend for you is the go home episode of raw. So WrestleMania course is on Sunday, six days prior, they announce you for the hall of fame and I want to play that clip right at the top of the show. This is four minutes, but I want everybody to hear the clip and the reaction. And and then we'll talk about it. Here we go. Okay. Well, I am excited about this because we will reveal the final member of the 2007 WWE hall of fame class of 2007. And we're going to reveal that member next voice has welcomed millions of fans to the wwe on monday nights for over a decade we are live in new york city and this is monday night raw when you hear jim ross you you know you've got it on the right channel you're watching the right program thank you so much folks for inviting us into your homes jim is like the john madden of wwe Jim Ross and Jerry the King Lawler with you live. Well, of course, we all know that good old JR has his own signature catchphrases. Shawn Michaels, Michaels getting get whipped like a government mule. mule. He's right on a scalded dog. Good job, Mike. Look at the courage. He's stomping a mole, walking a drop. I like what Jim Ross does. Business is about to pick up here. One of the all-time classics has got to be there. It's going to be a 
Slobberknocker. 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 Let the sports historians have the Giants win the pennant. I will take God is my witness. It was the greatest sports call ever made. There is no one in the history of wrestling that's been able to call a big time main event match like Jim Ross. And folks, this is what our business is all about. He just has that ability to connect with our fans. JL makes you hurt, makes you cry, makes you yell. Tell about everything he says truly comes from his heart. There's nobody that I would rather have calling my match than Jim Ross. You feel his passion for this business. The passion comes through because it's genuine. Where else can you feel this? His voice is plastered on so many great moments over the years. You can feel his emotion and you get caught up in his emotion. Cena has walked through hell. You can't contain it. A self-stopping spirit of Shawn Michaels lives. He's got an amazing gift. A lot of people are good, but very few people get great. He's great. Him doing announcing is what he was put on earth for. God, I love this job! I've often heard Jim say, you know, well, Gordon Soley was the best. And I'll look Jim Ross right in the eye and tell him, you're as good as Gordon Soley ever was. But there's just nobody better than Jim Ross. Austin, Stone Cold! Stone Cold! He's the best ever in the story. Ladies and gentlemen, the newest member into the WWE Hall of Fame, good old JR, Jim Ross! Pretty emotional, Connie, to be honest with you. Pretty damn emotional, my friend. I got tears in my eyes right now. We're still going, dude. Yeah, trying. I'm trying. I love it. I love, still love what I'm doing. I think that's the thing that keeps me in it. Uh, is the fact that I still love my job and I still love the fans and I still love the wrestling business. But man, you know, during that, uh, after Lawler made that announcement and the fans started reacting. I tried to sit down about two or three times and they kept going. Well, yeah. And, and, uh, Vince was telling a lawyer in his headset, don't let him sit down. This is too good. So it was a sustained ovation, which was so emotional and so moving. And, uh, you know, I was kind of cool. It was, I thought it was kind of cool to be the last guy in the class. Uh, but boy, that was a special night, special weekend, to be honest with you. You know, I can still remember where Jan was sitting, what she was wearing. My buddies, a lot of my buddies from Oklahoma flew up from here in Oklahoma to Chicago and, uh, were there. I don't know how many of them remember being there because all they did was drink. Uh, but nonetheless, it was a fun, fun scenario, fun deal. I got, I was going to my favorite little, uh, neighborhood bar called, uh, uh, what the hell is it called? <laughs> Uh, Louis, Louis here in uh, Norman. And I was walking to the bar to meet my buddies for the regular afternoon, uh, 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 happy hour. And I got a phone call from Kevin Dunn. He was in his office with John Gaborik. And he said, we wanted to, I wanted to let you know, you're going to be inducted to the hall of fame. And he kind of took me to my knees because quite frankly, all the political issues and the differences in philosophies and the, the head butting that I had with Vance from time to time. I really never thought I'd get that honor, to be honest with you. So, uh, but I also know that 
the plan was for me to end my career on raw that, that fall. And, uh, Todd Grisham was scheduled to be my replacement and be the, the voice of raw. Uh, so that never transpired. Things changed in the rest of us, Conrad. You notice that <laughs> I have Things changed. Uh, this- gonna, be, gonna be kind of fluid anyway. Mr. Thank you for playing. Say. Thanks for playing that. I haven't heard that over two or three times uh, in all these years. So it's kind of cool. Very emotional. Mouser says it was quite amazing. It was by far the single greatest crowd reaction to anyone ever in the Hall of Fame. Wow. It was one of those deals that you knew would be big, but it was so much of a spontaneous crowd reaction that you hardly expected it to be at that level. It was the closest thing to a Hogan or Austin return level of pop. Part of it was they had Austin rock Foley and triple H all over the video, putting him over as the greatest wrestling announcer ever. The video made him appear to be the Vin Scully of wrestling. He seemed to be moved and blown away by the reaction. I know I was all I could think about in amazement of all of this is trying to remember the number of times, including discussions nine weeks ago of wanting to replace him. Well, that's the journey I was on and, uh, you just persevere, buddy. It's a good lesson for all of us that are listening and watching today. If you, something you want badly enough, you, you can't get there if you don't, uh, continue the journey. And that's all I wanted to do. Just continue, continue on and see where my, where, where this hand that was dealt me took me. And, uh, it's been a pretty good run. Actually, I've been very blessed. I don't know if any other wrestling announcers have had my run. So I, for that statement, I consider myself extremely blessed. No doubt about it. Let's talk about the, uh, the hall of fame itself. I mean, you went in with, with quite a crew, the American dream, dusty Rhodes, Mr. Perfect, Kurt Henning, posthumously, Jerry, the King Lawler, your old broadcast partner, Nick Bockwinkle, Mr. Fuji, the Sheik, and yourself quite the class, man. Yeah, it was, it was, uh, I felt like a pair of brown shoes at a formal wedding with all those cats. Uh, but it was, uh, it was a neat deal. And the fact that Austin inducted me and we went on first the crowd was fresh. You know, we've talked about, and the guys have even chimed in. I've seen on social media, they, I saw where Jr. said, it's great to be in the first match at a big show like that. And I believe that because the audience is fresh. They're waiting yes. to, to be entertained. Yes. So, uh, it was, it was quite the day in Austin. I remember, I remember, uh, somebody told me the story that before Austin went out, somebody backstage wanted to see his speech. <laughs> That's like asking Austin to memorize his match. Okay. Now you do this and you do that and I'll kick you here and I'll slap my leg and all that stuff. So, uh, he said, I don't have no speech. I'm inducting Jr. It's easy. So he went out there and ad lived the whole damn thing. And I thought he, he came through pretty good. It made me look good. And, uh, but it was, a, we opened the show. So I thought that, as I said, so it's a, it was pretty cool. It was pretty, cause a cool weekend and, uh, and to have my little bride there, she was glowing with pr- pride, happiness, and all that. And, you know, that's just, uh, it's hard to look back at it and not get emotional. Such a cool day, such a cool moment. I'm glad we got to relive it today. Don't forget tomorrow. It's the undertaker's day. Um, yeah. The build of WrestleMania really begins back on January 8th when Vince McMahon scheduled an imposter Donald Trump to take on an imposter Rosie O'Donnell. The segment is long viewed as one of the worst in WWE history. And there were even people chanting T and a during the angle. Uh, and it's crazy to think this is the beginning of the build of one of the biggest, most drawing pay-per-views of all time, but it really did start with a bit of a dud angle. Did it not? Yeah, it was kind of flat. It, it didn't, uh. It was flat in the, in, in the, the context that, that it was, uh, it turned out, as you said, amazingly well, financially attendance wise, all those measurables, but it didn't look like it had a lot of momentum jumping out of the box. So, uh, but it's still WrestleMania, you know, and I, I'm a big believer that you can WrestleMania is just, uh, that word just exudes must see. And to have Trump there and Vince and the hair thing and, you know, all those, all those, uh, issues were, it was pretty cool. I thought it was going to be big, but I, I didn't know it was going to be as big as we did it. And it surely didn't start off big. 
So uh, eventually the show will sell out. We're going to have 80,103 people in the audience. Uh, of course, WrestleMania figures have heavily been debated, but whatever. Uh, the show did 5.38 million in ticket sales, which blew out the previous record, which was WrestleMania 18 that did 3.8 million. How much of that do you think is Trump versus McMahon versus the deciding factor? And how much of that is just the brand of WrestleMania? A lot of it's a brand Conrad without disrespecting Vince and Trump, but the Vince and Trump thing was so unique, but two bigger than life pop culture personalities. Uh, and the hair, either Trump's losing his or McMahon's losing his as a guarantee, uh, was kind of old school. You know, it's, uh, it's like, uh, uh I don't know, it's, it's, the business has changed so much, but you got to finish, so to speak. And as a result of that, uh, I thought the show was excellent. The, the tickets for the show actually go back on sale November 11th, 2006. And before they announced a single thing, 50,000 people had already purchased their tickets. There you go. There's that WrestleMania brand. That's that. It kind of answers our question. Yeah. What, what was big? Well, you know, having it in, in the stadium where the Super Bowl was held, uh, you know, Detroit's a historic WWE market. Uh, it was, it was pretty cool. It was pretty cool. I thought so. Uh, it, it, and it, it just, it took a life of its own. That was a hell of a show, hell of a TV product. Let's also mention it's the 20th anniversary of WrestleMania three as we're building towards Detroit here. Uh, right. Triple H's injury the year before had left John Cena without an opponent. And the early speculation, uh, was that it would be Shawn Michaels with Trump against Booker with Vince. Of course, we know that doesn't wind up happening. But I guess that could have been interesting, Sean and Booker. Yeah, they had a good match. Yeah. Especially at that level. Both guys being very competitive uh, and very, uh, you know, proud of their work uh, and play on that stage in that role would have been uh, excellent. They, they would have had a great match. There's no doubt about it. Uh, maybe a better match than we had for the hair. Because it's hard to discount Michael's and Booker T's abilities. And, uh, but you know, I don't want to, I don't want to downgrade the late Umaga's contributions and, and, uh, Bobby Lashley was green and young and probably wasn't ready for that spot, but, uh, they were hoping in time he'd become ready. And as here, all these years later, we've kind of seen that now he's, uh, he's done a great job. Bobby has, he's starting to understand the business better. So, uh, he's, he's become a player and, but back then. We were hoping and had great confidence. He was going to be a player. It just took a little bit longer than I think most people perceived it would. Well, the Shawn Michaels thing really picks up some steam. Once Hunter's injured, Sean gets a lot of fire and steam working against rated RKO. And a lot of folks start to think, Hey, maybe it's better if Sean winds up taking on Cena for the world title. Of course we know that's the way, way it all shook out. And there's speculation going into the rumble that the office had maybe lost some of their faith in Batista with his title run and the plan of maybe Taker losing his streak to Batista was starting to falter. Do you remember hearing originally Batista was going to be the guy who might be considered to beat the undertaker streak? Casual talk, Connie, but not dead serious. That undertaker streak was always, uh, perceived as something extraordinarily special and, uh, unduplicatable. And, uh, so you're always going to have that question come every WrestleMania. Is this, is this going to be the WrestleMania that take her, take her streak uh, ends. So I know that Dave was in the conversation, but I don't know how seriously that conversation was. Uh, you know, Vince was very protective of that streak until Lesnar broke it. And, uh, you know, uh, that, that helped Brock immensely, quite frankly. And, uh, I couldn't believe it when I saw it. Cause I, I was not one for beating, for ending the streak. I, I believe the streak should still be intact to this very day. That's just me being an old school guy that likes those kind of things. And it's a uh, solid and it's real. And so anyhow, I, uh, I'm a big, uh, believer of things like that. And so when undertaker lost the streak, I, I was a little disappointed, but I don't think Dave was ever seriously considered but he was, uh, in the conversation. 
So let's jump into uh, Taker and Michaels as the last two in the Rumble. And the epic showdown is eventually going to lead to two WrestleMania matches years later. But you probably knew even just watching that Rumble, ooh, there's something here, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah no doubt. You know, it's just uh, hard to, uh, uh, when you look at the talents that we're talking about, it's just hard to envision them in a negative presentation. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, and my, and Sean had chemistry with just about everybody. I mean, in the ring, there were his issues outside the ring and his attitudinal things that uh, he endured and went through and, 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 uh, perpetrated whatever the word words might be here. But you knew that the one thing you knew is that Michaels would never let you down bell to bell. It'd be great. And, uh, so it was, it was and we were lucky and shit to have Sean available at that point in time. Oh yeah. You know, star power wise, but I think we, you know, we, we kind of answered our question about, oh, what's, uh, when you sell 50,000 tickets with no matches announced, that's on the brand of WrestleMania, quite frankly, obviously. So. You know, it was, uh, it was, a it was, a inter- it was interesting, interesting times, but the battle of the billionaires was the, you know, no matter how you slice it and how you look at it, even though it was a gimmick thing, it was the, it was a showstopper show stealer. It was the show maker. So, uh, taker's going to win and, uh, the tease of the undertaker determining which champion between John Cena and Batista is at least an interesting story because taker and Cena had never really had a high profile match at that time. Taker does wind up, of course, choosing to take on Batista. Michaels goes into a three-way with edge and Orton to determine the num- determine the number one contender. Of course, Sean gets the win, but as for the battle of the billionaires, that's probably what is going to have mainstream talking about it. Yep. So we've got the battle of the billionaires, the world title match with the title versus the streak. And of course, John Cena and Shawn Michaels, if you had to put your finger on it all these years later, what was the quote unquote real main event? Oh, it's hard. I think it's kind of easy. It was, uh, the hair. Yeah. The hair, the hair stipulation had most people talking. And the thing about, uh, you know, I, I was not a big fan of Trump's presidency. Uh, I'm not going to start talking about politics here or religion, by the way. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I at the time he yeah. was a number one television star. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he's, yeah. He had his TV show. Yep. And, uh, he was, he found a way into the newspapers, into the gossip columns, uh, all these things readily. He was, a he was, a he was tremendous about self-promoting. And he knew he was going to go over quote unquote. So he was, uh, he was all over the place. I don't know. I often wonder knowing his personality, of course, there was never a consideration. He's going to lose his hair for God's sakes, but still remains a mystery to mankind. What kind of hair, what is that hair? How's that work? Where's it parked? Where's it stop? Where's the stock? You know? Uh, but he, Trump was a key element in that whole deal. And, uh, and I know it best paid him very, very well, way north of seven figures to, to be a part of the, of the, of the process. And I think I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, I think Trump got like, and I don't know what the number is, but I think he got a, like a package deal for, you know, cause he came on raw a lot. Mm-hmm. You know, I remember going to green Bay and he was giving free tickets or money or something. Uh, cause I know I had a long talk with Trump that night at, uh, in green Bay. And his dorky kids around him. Uh, but, uh, he was invested in this deal. He, he, here's the thing about Trump. He didn't want to look bad, Connie. He didn't want to be perceived as, uh, you know, a goof. And, uh, so he put his heart and he, he, he committed to it. And I, which I was impressed with, he made all of his dates. He was always on time. So, you know, it was a good deal, but. To do, to say we would have done, has had a success, as successful on pay-per-view, especially this event without Trump would be misleading. Do you think the, there's a rumor that Batista and, and Undertaker were upset when they were told they're not the main event. I think they expected to go on last. Do you think, uh, I mean, do you remember that reaction or are they being upset with that in particular? I don't remember the, uh, being upset. They may have been disappointed, 
that they weren't finally going to close the show at the biggest event of the year. I can see that. Uh, but it just wasn't in the card. Just not how the card was booked. And it was also highly, and what was the, what went on last in that show? Uh, the, again, we've got three supposed main events, but it's seen as Shawn Michaels. That's, uh, going to close the show. And you know, that was a, that was a, another, that probably was the biggest, you know, issue for taker and Batista that they're being trumped by no pun intended, uh, by Sean and Cena. But how do you argue that you can, you yeah. can make a good argument for any of those. That's scenarios. exactly right. Yeah. You totally can. There's no wrong answer in that deal, but I can understand the disappointment that, that uh, taker and, uh, Batista had, uh, and, but that's just the way the, 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 that's the, that was the luck of the draw, if you will. So Trump appears on raw on January 29th. It's uh, Vince McMahon's fan appreciation night, and he's going to be dropping real money from the ceiling, uh, to the fans to really ignite the feud. Uh, and the observer reports at the time, there's, there's also talk of big show and Hulk Hogan, but the big show's back was so bad. He wasn't willing to sign a new deal with WWE. Do you think the, uh, I don't know. Could this have been bigger? You know, it is the 20th anniversary of WrestleMania three and having Hogan slam someone who is arguably the biggest giant since Andre mm -hmm. that, that could have been nostalgic, right? Yeah. It could have been a five minute segment. Yeah. That's about it. And I'm thinking maybe one of the reasons that uh, big show was not interested, uh, other than his back, uh, being problematic was the fact that he didn't want a job for Hogan. He, he, I'm sure big show thought it's my turn to get for Hogan to put me over. And that wasn't, and that was a consideration quite frankly, but I, I don't know that the, you know, Hogan's the relationship there was off and on good and bad, mediocre, lukewarm, whatever. Uh, it was never something that we spent a lot of time talking about. Cause he needed to work with a giant to replicate the Andre thing. We had one giant and that one giant wasn't willing to play in that role. And again, uh, his, uh, he's big show has had problems with his, uh, back and things like a lot of guys. And when you're that large and you, and, and uh, it, it's easy to manifest itself into something more serious, but I think politically speaking, creatively speaking. I'm sure that big show may have thought he hasn't told me this, but I'm, I'm assuming he was probably thinking, well, this is my turn to get a big win. You know, I can, I can body slam Hogan. I won't hurt him. I can, I can do something. I can drop a leg on him. Like he drops on everybody else and, and get my win, but that was not in the cards. So it's announced on February 11th that the battle of the billionaires is going to be a hair match where the loser is going to get shaved bald. Of course, a lot of our younger listeners or older listeners remember back in the day, there was a constant joke about Vince wearing a toupee. And as you said, a lot of people in mainstream media were interested in Trump's hair. So a hair match where maybe some people think, oh, that's old Memphis. Well, that actually makes sense with these guys clearly as evidenced by the numbers, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. That was, a, it was a great, it was a perfect step, a perfect step for what we were uh, trying to accomplish. It was easy to process. If Trump's guy wins, McMahon gets his head shaved and vice versa. That's it. That's where we were. And we're hoping that two young, big studs like uh, Umaga and, uh, Bobby Lashley could deliver the goods, uh, in that, uh, in, in that role in that environment. And I, and I thought they did, did well. I really did considering they were overshadowed by the, uh, overshadowed by the stiff. The stiff was the big thing. Who's getting their head shaved. Right. That was it. So it's known at the time that Lashley is going to be the guy, but the baby face is, uh, what really needs to be a big part of the focus and, you know, having this endorsement, if you will, in this sort of match, how do you think we land on Lashley? Not criticizing the pick. Yeah. But do you, what do you think Vince is thinking was at the time with Lashley being the guy? Well, to build a future star, you know, we had yeah. great confidence in Bobby and, and a way to launch Bobby Lashley's run is, uh, uh, in the role that he had, he was on the go over 
Uh, and of course you had Austin as a referee, which is, it helped, uh, cause getting Steve in that, in that process was kind of cool. So, uh, but I think it was all about, uh, moving Bobby up another notch and launching that big ship of his, uh, off to sea and hopefully, uh, or he'd be headlining many more WrestleManias, uh, sooner than later. It didn't work out sooner. But it has worked out later for Bobby. Bobby's become a big star at WWE. No doubt about it. Uh, Saturday night's main event is scheduled to be on NBC to help promote WrestleMania, but it's eventually canceled according to the observer because ad sales were not there. Uh, and Donald Trump's gimmick is really put together by NBC universal as a vehicle to promote his reality show at the time, the apprentice. But when you see Saturday night's main event, not get the ad buys. Do you start to get a little nervous? Do you think in the office? I'm sure there was some apprehensions and, and, uh, head scratching, but, uh, you know, we're, we, we were ready to roll. It was uh two, you can't turn back now. And, uh, so it, it was just another bump in the road. I guess it was a big bump, but it wasn't a insurmountable situation that was going to kill the show. So Roddy Piper is going to announce Dusty Rhodes as the first inductee when uh, the, the show goes to Portland. Rhodes comes out and both him and Piper get attacked and laid out by Umaga. And this is going to be the push for him to be Vince McMahon's man in this whole battle of the billionaires. Um, it's all, it's all entertainment, of course, but you just compare the way we heard fans react and the, the respect and all that you were given in your hall of fame and. And then here's what we're doing for dusties in hindsight. What do you think of that? Uh, what do you mean to explain that? To well, I mean, they announced you and you stand up to a big standing ovation and it's a huge thing. And then they announced dusty and Umaga comes out and beats him up. Oh, not good. Yeah. Not good. Well, you know, there again, you're trying to get Umaga ready for WrestleMania. Yeah. Get us a heat on the heel. You think that's like that though? I mean, there's a certain thinking of, oh man, this is, this is wrestling. He'd love that. Uh, I, well, Dusty would love it if he got a comeback <laughs> like any baby face. Sure. I'll help the heel get some heat and letting, you know, beat me up, but where to get my comeback. Right. Uh, but I, I wasn't overwhelmed with that creative process, but it didn't kill the deal. And, you know, Dusty was a the, uh, uh, I guess the centerpiece of that hall of fame class. He was in my eyes. Yeah. He's the headliner. I think everybody yeah, agrees. He, he was, he was a headliner and, uh, but he didn't have Austin and I did. So there you go. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so ECW is running an angle where the, the new breed and the ECW originals are all at odds against each other. At this point, does anybody give a shit about ECW? I mean, it was super hot in 05 with one night stand. And then we relaunch it in 06, but by 07, buddy, it just feels DOA. Well, the ECW fan base that loved to chant EC dub, EC dub, no matter what, uh, they were interested. I don't know how many of them, but I don't know how many there were of them, but it, it, it had cooled off immensely. You know, the, without a doubt, it cooled off immensely and, but you know, they, they, I'll, I'll, I'll always say that ECW brought an interesting element, a uh, new creative element to uh, the process that wasn't a bad thing whatsoever. Uh, and it gave them second life and take them off life support. Maybe, I don't know, but nonetheless, uh, ECW had cooled at, at, the, at the period of time you're talking about. Were you still able to keep up with raw SmackDown and ECW or since you're mostly doing raw, are you just keeping up with raw? No, I watched it all. I watched it all. It was cause again, you know, I'm managing a talent roster. Yeah. I want to make sure everybody's doing their best work in my eyes and, uh, and producing winning. So no, I watched, I watched it all Conrad, you know, and most of the time, uh, remember that SmackDown was taped on Tuesdays, right? And, uh, as I recall, we hadn't gone live at that point in time. I don't believe. So, uh, I was already, I was at TV. So it'd been foolish for me not to watch the talents work and cause they wanted feedback. They're always Hey, what do you think? JR blah, blah, blah. So, but, uh, I watched it all. 
I probably watched less of ECW than I watched of SmackDown for obvious reasons. Uh, but I did keep up with it. Um, a switch is made after some pretty lackluster brand specific pay-per-views. And now all the brands are going to be back involved. Is that an admission that, you know, this brand extension just isn't really taking fire. Like we would have hoped. Probably does. Uh, you know, I've always said that the brand extension was a failed experiment from the get go because within a matter of weeks, episodes of television, what have you, uh, it was, uh, we were already cheating. SmackDown guys are on raw. The raw guys are on SmackDown. It, it, there's no, there was no exclusivity. And I, I always believed that the magic of a brand split was that you saw these guys against each other or in conflict with each other from the various brands, uh, seldom infrequently. And, uh, we never did that. We always seem to intermingle. Oh, we're in a booking conundrum and we got this problem. We need to do this and we got to, well, let's get him back over here. Let's get them doing this. It's just, uh, it watered it down in my estimation. And, it, and I don't know that we ever got it right. Steve Austin is brought in to be the special guest referee for the battle of the billionaires. Do you think Steve saw the opportunity here with Trump being the TV star, or is this not something he could possibly get excited about? Because after all that he's done, it's just a referee gig. Well, it's a referee gig for a whole lot of money and a good spot. He was going to referee a, a baby face win. He was going to oversee Vince getting his hair shaved, head shaved. So there was a little something, something there for the, uh, legendary baby face stone cold, but again, he didn't do it for charity. And, uh, he, and he got, he was also in all the artwork. So his image, when they did a graphic of Trump and McMahon, it all, it always had Bobby in it and it had the uh, Umaga in it and now Steve. So for a talent who's working on other projects and wants to maintain his name identity and, and do what he can to not allow, allow people to forget him. Uh, it was a smart move for Austin. I thought it was a, and it was a good role. Again, thinking back, he wasn't going to be involved in a screw job. Uh, he wasn't going to be turning heel. It was just a pretty straight piece of business. And, uh, and then he got his spots in, I think he, there was a stunner or two in that, 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 uh, match if I'm not mistaken. So I think Steve was happy with that role, you know, uh, he's, he was, uh, and which I, I go back to that about what we're, what he, what he's going to do this weekend. Uh, you know, I hope he does great. I think he probably will. I think he's going to surprise the hell out of us. And I think what we're going to be talking about after this Conrad is, uh, well, he ought to wrestle more. Yeah. He's got more in him. Must, he should do more. And I don't think that's ever going to occur. I might be dead ass wrong. I think if he can get this one match done where he he's happy with his performance in the ring, uh, no matter what they're going to do, they're disguising a match and not all these Kevin Owen show and all that other stuff, but make no mistake about it. There's going to be stunners. There's going to be beer drinking. There's going to be the moment that you want. There's going to be the moment that happened 19 years later. Uh, so I think it's all going to work out really well for him, but he, he, I don't recall him having any, uh, any issues and the fact that he was going to induct me into, he was going to induct me in the hall of fame, whether he was booked on a card or not. So I thought that was kind of cool. He was the only, he was the only person I approached to induct me in the hall of fame. I didn't have a list. Well, if Austin don't want to do it, I'll go to this guy and so forth. I didn't have a, I didn't have a backup plan. He was the guy it had to be him. And he, he acquiesced and took care of me. And, uh, I'll always appreciate that. So the money in the bank match has expanded from six folks from the prior two years to eight guys. And this one, probably just because the roster has expanded. It's also bringing us Kane and great Kali Melina versus Ashley Massaro for the women's title. Uh, and Melina, Melina actually beat Mickey James for the title and Ashley's playboy spread is due to come out not long after WrestleMania. Of course, Ashley's sadly no longer with us. Uh, I think we're near the three year anniversary of that. Yeah. Um, what do you think of Ashley Massaro? We haven't spent a lot of time talking about her. Was she ready to be the next big diva featured in playboy? I don't think so. Not at that point in time. 
could she have been there and gotten there over time? I think so. I think she could have done that, but she was the new kid on the block. She had a great look, you know, playboy enjoyed working with her. Uh, so, uh, but I, as far as being ring ready, uh, and emotionally ready for the pressures of that role, I don't think so. That's just my personal take on it. And I liked her. She's a nice lady. God bless her soul. But she had, she was still carrying around those demons even then. So she had, she was overcoming battles every day. And I just thought the instability of that scenario, uh, was not a good fit for her and her expanded role. So I'd answer no on that question. So at the no way out main event, the WrestleMania title matches are teaming up against each other. It's Sean and John taking on undertaker and Batista. Cena's going to pin taker after Batista hit taker with a spine buster. And I guess the thinking is we might need Batista to have some of a heel edge. If he's taken on, um, the undertaker here and right. we've got a bunch of baby faces against each other. Yeah. You needed to give him an edge back. Can he be trusted? What's he going to do against taker? Blah, blah, blah. Um, but it was interesting booking. It's traditional booking. Actually, you know, you take, you take those two top singles matches, you put them into a tag, your stories stay intact. It's easy for the announcers to continue to tell the same story, building to the pay-per-view, uh, and Dave needed a little bit of an edge cause Dave was getting over. I mean, he was popular. People liked it. He was, you know, he's, you know, men could live vicariously to that big brute and the women loved him. So, uh, yeah, he needed a little something, something there. I, I, I think sometimes that's overrated though. Uh, in my own thinking about my own statement there, their personal issue, you know, they're wrestling for a championship that should have been enough to be honest with you. And there was psychology that they utilized in that process, uh, would have been pr pr pretty cool, but, uh, you know, the old traditionalist. Well, we need to give, you know, takers a baby face or taker. wasn't going to get booed. Come on. Uh, Batista may have been cheered or was going to be cheered, but I don't think this little situation, uh, uh, solved any of those issues. Kerr Henning is announced as being a member of the upcoming hall of fame class. And this is where we start to hear rumors about you and Lawler going in in hindsight, would you have preferred you and Lawler go in separately so he can induct you and you induct him, or you're pretty pleased with the way it went. You did get Steve Austin there. Yeah, that was, you know, Jerry needed his moment. Jerry took a lot more time in selecting who he was going to, who was going to induct. Jerry wanted a star, a mainstream like star to induct him. He wanted to be different. And that's just old Memphis booking <clears throat> and the philosophy of such, uh, I'm glad we went in separately. Cause I, I believe that Jerry certainly deserved his moment. He'd been in the Venice a long time, uh, and had, had been had achieved star status years before. So I'm glad that we went in separately. If nothing else, the main reason that Jerry got his, he got his performance. I remember, uh, you know, he had William Shatner indu induct him and Shatner thought all the speech was going to be on a teleprompter. There was no teleprompter. So Lawler was tutoring, uh, William Shatner before the show about what to say, what not to say, things like that. But it was a little dicey for me. I had stone cold. I had no worries. I had that issue did not concern me whatsoever. Cause I knew I'm, I'm going to be taken care of. I think Jerry was a little apprehensive. He, he originally wanted, uh, and almost got him, uh, oh, Justin Timberlake, another Memphis guy who yeah. grew up watching Lawler. And I thought that was a, if Justin Timberlake had been available from a work schedule wise, uh, that, that would have been, uh, that would have been the deal. And that would have been a huge hit. Uh, but he wasn't available, but I think he sent us, you know, his regrets and so forth, but he was a Lawler fan back in the, when he was a kid, Justin Timberlake, I'm speaking of, but then he ended up with William Shatner. And, uh, that was all based off that one angle, uh, that they did on raw one time years ago. So it was a little more dicey than my situation. But I did believe that we going us going in uh, indiv individually was the right way to go. So let's talk about Bobby Lashley here. He's going to defend his ECW title against Hardcore Holly in a steel cage match. And the hottest part is when Lashley and Umaga uh, are, are going to get into the mix. 
Lashley gets the win, but Umaga's outside the ring taunting Lashley. Lashley's going to take off and fly through the cage, smash through the cage and on to Umaga. Quite a sight to see a guy run through a cage. We've never seen that before, as far as I can recall. Yeah, just to try to another unique spot to uh, solidify how powerful and dynamic Bobby Lashley was. You know, I, the way I looked at it is that, uh, and it's an old school reference. Some that understand will get it. Some others, they might not. But Lashley was set up to be uh, Vince's version of JYD. African-American, powerhouse, lots of charisma, maybe not the greatest wrestler, uh, but Lashley was a lot better wrestler than JYD. But JYD had that charisma that you couldn't, you know, you couldn't define or manufacture. So, uh, but it was another, another point in the resume of Bobby Lashley that this is a very special powerhouse that is going places. Just a week later, Steve Austin is announced officially on raw. He's going to be become the uh, special guest referee for that battle of the billionaires, but the pop is gigantic. The whole setup with Shane and Vince thinking they had it in the bag. And then Austin's music hits Woo, really well done. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime Austin comes back, it's, it'll be the same thing this weekend. You know, he's, he's the most over guy and, and you know, and I know this is going to cause, uh, some debate in, in some camps and I'm not dis, dis, disrespecting anybody, but in my view, and I'm pi- and I'm biased, Austin was the most popular wrestler ever in WWE. Yeah. For a guy to create this much buzz 16 or 19 years later, wherever the hell it is, is extraordinary. It just doesn't happen. So, uh, Austin was, that was a great get for Vince and a good, good booking, quite frankly. And I'm glad Steve was still the mindset that he wanted to do it. So the storyline for Cena and Sean is building quite well as well. Uh, they have a tag team title match with a uh, rated RKO, but Orton and edge start playing psychological warfare with Cena. Uh, Sean has turned on all of his partners and his friends in the past. And you see clips of Sean breaking up the rockers, triple H in the NWO, but Sean makes a promise to John. They'll be partners until mania. And when mania come, mania comes, all bets are off. What did you think of that story? Two baby faces, but can we trust one? I liked it. And I liked it because the central figure in this, uh, scenario was the title. It, it enhanced the title. It was a shine on the belt that you probably own. Uh, <laughs> if anybody owns it, you got one. Uh, so I, because of they, they had a common cause. They had both had a common goal. And that was their leave WrestleMania 23 with the championship. So I like that. I, I thought that worked out really well. So for money in the bank, these eight competitors are geared up for the chance to win the contract for a world title match. It's edge punk Booker Hardy Kennedy, the other Hardy Finley and Orton. Um, so you've got some ring veterans, some daredevils, some guys who are trying to make their names for themselves. Um, this is a pretty big time one, especially when you consider all the talent that's in there. Unfortunately, Ernie Ladd passes away on March 10th after a near four year battle with cancer. You've talked a little bit about your time with Ernie way back when in the Cowboys territory, what are your favorite memories of Ernie? You can share with us. Ernie was a mentor to me. Uh, Ernie liked me. Uh, my nickname was the junk food dog. (laughs) That's what Ernie called me the junk food dog. Uh, and on our, we would go down to Shreveport every other week and, uh, write television with cowboy for mid South. We did two shows every other Wednesday night at the Irish McNeil boys club. And so after those meetings we had in, in, uh, in, uh, sorry, say Vince's, uh, Vince's, uh, room, it was Bill's room, same difference. Uh, we would go to my room and open the patio door on the first floor there at this, uh, holiday Inn near the airport at Shreveport pretty new at that time, I think. And we played dominoes till three or four o'clock in the morning. So over those domino games, we different talents would come up and Ernie would tell stories related to those talents. He'd tell me why they got over, why they didn't get over. So it was like going to class every, uh, night school, if you will, cause cowboy is going to go to bed and Ernie and I want to go to my room, smoke. And, uh, 
I, I just had amazing uh, respect for him. For him to be, if you think about it, it's, it's, and you put it in today's terminology or today's scenarios, Ernie was a black heel and most promoters were reluctant to book a black heel because of the heat that uncontrollable heat that they perceived these, uh, uh the big bully black guy was going to have, uh, when he beat up, a, a Caucasian, a hero, Ernie had no fear. And for that, I always had great respect for him. So, uh, but that's also why Bill booked uh, Ernie against dog and some other black stars was to kind of control that animosity because racism, as we all know, Conrad, unfortunately, is still very prominent in our world, which it wasn't, but it is. And, uh, people had, uh, deep rooted animosity toward, uh, successful black people. You know, Arnie told me one time that, uh, uh, white man, uh, biggest concern was an educated black man. <clears throat> and there's something to be said about that, but especially in that era. So, but Ernie was my mentor and, uh, he was just, uh, a, a, a blessing for me in my career. <clears throat> Pardon me. You know, I had Bill Watts there, uh, teach me everything. And then his right-hand man, Ernie Ladd was teaching me the rest of the story. So I was very lucky in that regard. And then not a lot of young guys, uh, in the wrestling business would have had two mentors so powerful, so influential and so knowledgeable as I had with uh, cowboy and Ernie. Hey folks, it's time to take your podcast game to the next level. And you certainly want to get your almighty push. My God, we have to have a push, right? We'll get that over to adfreeshows.com. Now I'm telling you, if you're a fan of grilling, JR adfreeshows.com has the entire episode library and it's got no ads zero ads zilf none ad free and on video starting at just nine bucks did you hear what i what i said nine dollars you spend more than that at starbucks for god's sakes two mornings but that's not all folks we got tons of bonus content including my after hours round table where drinking was involved with eric and tony you simply will not find a better value in all of wrestling. Hey, look, don't make me go red ass because by God, you know, I will hurry over to adfreeshows.com right now and sign up. And I thank you. Let's, uh, let's jump into the show. 77% of the readers of the wrestling observer really enjoyed WrestleMania 23 and gave it a, a thumbs up. As we mentioned, we got 80,103 fans here announced Meltzer says it's the third biggest show in company history. He claims it was the, uh, WrestleMania three show and SummerSlam 92 and Wembley that were the only two that were larger. That's pretty good company here. Is it not? Yeah, it sure is. Uh, it really is. It was, and, and, you know, I think the, the last super bowl, the, the super bowl that was held last before WrestleMania 23 was in that arena. Uh, it was a new facility. So it's, you know, it's pretty new, beautiful dome. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was just amazing, uh, about how popular we had a, we had the right mix. In other words, we knew that. Taker and Batista would have a hell of a match. You know, that Michaels and Cena are going to have a hell of a match. So in my, and th th then you had that ladder match. I thought the ladder match was a little overbooked, uh, too many bodies, but it got everybody a payday, which is cool. And, uh, but I, I thought that the, uh, ladder was a little bit overbooked too many bodies. Uh, I was spoiled because. I'm a big fan of the original ladder matches involving edge and Christian and the Hardys and, uh, and the Dudleys. So, uh, but then you had all these other guys and I'm not saying the other guys weren't deserving or should have got their break and earned a paid nice payday for that, for their, for their work. But man, oh man, I just, uh, I thought it was a little overbooked, but so we knew that the match wise, we were covered, but all people seemingly wanted to talk about Conrad was the battle of the billionaires. 
Yeah. Who McMahon and Donald Trump were amazingly strong personalities that had great and incredible name identity. And the payoff for the fans was one of those two gentlemen are going to leave with their head with their head shaved. So, uh, I, I thought we were pretty, we were pretty good shape actually, uh, from an attraction standpoint. And I, to be honest with you, until I look at the notes, uh, I didn't know, I couldn't remember what all was on that card. Uh, I, uh, to be honest with you, but, uh, I knew that we, from a wrestling fan standpoint, we had the product that could go bell to bell and not leave anybody disappointed. Well, this show does 1,188,000 buys on pay-per-view only seen a rock at WrestleMania 28 had more pay-per-view buys. So even though it might not be regarded as being the best WrestleMania ever at this point, it is the most successful and it ain't close, but it's not without a little bit of controversy, something that I'd never heard of until we started doing research for this show. The observer wrote this. About the closest thing to late controversy were the last day's discussion since Shane wanted to be in the ring, opening the show and welcoming fans to WrestleMania, reprising the often shown clip of his father doing the same thing 20 years earlier at the Silverdome. Evidently, the anti Shane forces were strong enough because when the show opened, there was Vince McMahon in the ring, just like 20 years ago, introducing Aretha Franklin to sing America the Beautiful. This was a significant topic of discussion as on the day before the day of, and the day after several people within the company talked about it as if it was a very significant piece of evidence of who will have P uh, who will have power in the future. Of course, I'm sure a lot of these folks, when they're saying that Jim, they're saying, oh, that means that it's going to be Stephanie. It's not going to be Shane. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. You know, it feels like it's, uh an ever evolving process. Do you think Vince has a succession plan ready right now? Uh, one would hope I assume he does. I just don't know. Maybe the succession plan is to package it up and sell it. Yeah. That's what I think. Uh, but you know, I said it before and I don't mean to make it morbid. I mean, he's the genius behind the whole damn thing. He's very protective of what he's built and I would be the same way. I think you'd be the same way. We're going to protect what we've built. Of course. You know, save with Conrad.com. That's what you <laughs> built. And you're not going to pass that on to Dave Silva. No. I don't think you are. You might. If you do, well, congratulations today. Uh, but, you know, seriously, the, I think Vince's succession plan is, you know, he, he's the kind of guy that thinks he's going to live forever. And I hope that he does. He'll probably outlive me and he might outlive you. Hell, I don't know. Uh, he still trains hard and eats right and all those things. And he's got good DNA, you know, as, uh, I think his mom did to be, she was what, in her nineties or something. This is like 101 or something. Well, so it's really amazing. Yeah. So I don't know about the succession plan. I think they have to say they have one, uh, simply for their stockholders, uh, sake. But, uh, I, I think that it's such an attractive property with so many diverse tentacles that spread around the world. Uh, I think it's an attractive buy for some big company. And it seems like that's kind of the direction that some big businesses are heading in Conrad. They're selling, they're conduct, they're, they're consolidating and they're selling. Uh, and that might be, that might be where it says that. I don't know how to answer that question, but I, I, I just can't see today. I can't see anybody, uh, taking his place as a head at the head of the table. Just can't, I don't know who's. I don't know who's there. There's people who can do it, I guess, but I don't know who they are and not, uh, what's available. And if the events trust them in, impeccably enough to turn the reins over to them. Let's talk about the dark match here. Cause it's rather interesting. There's only one and it's Ric Flair and Carlito meeting Gregory Helms and Chavo in a lumberjack match. There was originally talk of a tag team battle Royal. Instead, all the wrestlers not booked on the card were made lumberjacks here. And with the mania match or the mania show ending 20 minutes early, Meltzer says this could have easily been on the show. And it is interesting to take a look at this and recognize, well, this is WrestleMania 23 and come WrestleMania 24. It's the big celebration for Ric Flair to leave here. He's on the pre-show, right? Uh, strange, right? Yeah. Well, 
it's interesting. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, I mean, listen, I understand that Vince has been telling Rick, we're going with youth since 1993. So <laughs> I guess eventually it, it has to happen, but hindsight being what it is to take a look at the, the wonderful send off he gets next year. And now he's on the pre-show. That's something you got to scratch your head about a little bit. Yeah, it is, it is a little bit. Uh, I, I know the fans, uh, the match, that, that match got a very good, uh, reception. Yeah. Fans are happy to see him and to see Nate's in the, in the ring at WrestleMania in front of, you know, whatever it was, 75, 80,000 people. Uh, but it was a interesting, unique placement for a legend like that. And in hindsight, again, as Meltzer alluded to, based on the fact the show ended early, which I wasn't, I'd forgotten, uh, that match could have gone on the, on the main show and would have been fine. It just, uh, that wasn't the plan at that point in time. So here's the first match on the show and what a barn burner to start with. It's money in the bank. And instead of six guys, it's eight guys and check out this roster, man, Mr. Kennedy. Edge, Jeff Hardy, Matt Hardy, CM Punk, Randy Orton, King Booker, Fit Finley, nonstop headliners, nonstop main eventers, Hall of Famers. And Meltzer would say it didn't feel like a match as much as a collection of high spots. It was clear the idea was not to copy spots that had been done before. They didn't have the crazy being knocked off the ladder and flying outside the ring or being crotched like other Mania ladder matches. It really built to one spectacular spot which was Jeff Hardy coming off very close to the top of a 15 foot ladder, probably 13 feet and jumping off with a cannonball like sitting splash onto edge who was laying on a ladder that was draped between the ring apron and the guardrail edge was stretchered out, thus ending his WrestleMania winning streak at five shows. Edge was pretty messed up that night at the WrestleMania after party. And it was feared. He got a concussion with the bump. He also notes all six announcers were doing this match, which is usually a recipe for disaster with constant bickering and talking over each other. But I guess they were told ahead of time to not, and to try to detract from the match. And it worked out fine. Um, we were lucky. We were lucky. We were lucky there. I'm sorry, Conrad. We were, we were lucky because everybody on that announced team of the first match was, uh, reluctant, too many talking heads, six announcers. You know, it's not, it's not the old Vince does not believe apparently unless it's more. No. And, uh, it was just, it, it was just a way of getting a lot more guys on the show. And it feels, know, like, a much, joke. It feels like a rib. Yeah. It, it kind of was, uh, it's like, uh, f- you think flares match needed lumberjacks? No, of course not. Guys needed to be on the pay sheet. That's what it was. And, uh, that's not a good reason I, I could pay them. I could pay them what they probably earned that night without them ever wrestling and everything would have been cool, but that's not the way it was. So, uh, anyway, I just, I'm not good. I'm not big on that. Well, let's get all these guys on a the card. They deserve it. I agree. Well, if they deserved it that much, then it'd be booked that they worked their way into the card. They would have been booked. Uh, so. Uh, they deserve, you know, I don't know who, who of us deserve what, I mean, how do you determine that? So, uh, those are two in- illustrations of overkill, the announcers on the first match and the lumberjacks, uh, with the, the, uh, pre-show match featuring Ric Flair. Well, the gimmick in this ladder match is Finley doesn't like to climb. So he sends Hornswoggle up the ladder, but of course, Swoggle gets to the top, but he's too short to reach the briefcase. So Kennedy <laughs> gives him a big bump, pretty fun stuff. Kennedy is your winner. Uh, it gets four and a quarter stars. This has got to be one of the best money in the bank matches ever at this point. Right? Yeah, it was a good match. I just thought it was overbooked. I didn't think we needed uh, so many guys. I missed edge and Christian. They're not in this match, right? Edge, edge stretched out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I missed the Dudleys. Yeah. But they brought a special energy and creativity. You know, uh, Bubba Dudley's a, a, had a great mind for stuff like that. It still does for wrestling. Uh, I listened to him and Dave LeGreca a lot on busted open. They do a super job, uh, among the whole crew there at Sirius XM, but I, I miss some of my stalwarts. I miss some of my regulars 
that I love calling matches for in this particular match, especially. So, but it was a, it was a hell of a match. I mean, here's the thing that fans need to understand. You got one agent, one, one coach, one trainer, whatever you want to say, uh, that's putting this damn thing together. Somehow you've got to make eight guys happy. Somehow you've got to get eight guys invested. And, uh, I find that challenging to do on a regular basis. I will say that on this particular case, and I don't even know who the agent was at this juncture, but they did it and it over exceeded its expectations in my estimation, really good match. So next up, Greg Collie and Kane, they go five and a half minutes. They get a negative one star. Meltzer said it was just terrible quote. Jim Ross even got the bowling shoe reference in when it came to Kali's offense and his selling is far worse than his offense. The match was built to the slam with the idea of repeating the Hogan slam on Andre, but it got no pop. Kali won with the tree slam. Not our best outing for Mr. Kane here. No, no, I, I didn't like that match. That was just Kane deserved to be on the card. Uh, skill set wise, uh, dues paying wise. You know, uh, all those things, Kali, not so much. He just wasn't ready. Dollop was not a bad guy. He was friendly and, and he was in a different country. He's trying to learn a different language. He was an attraction guy. If you saw him on TV, uh, a handful of times a year, like, like, uh, Andre used to be booked. So be it, but he was getting overexposed and, uh, same thing happened to big show when he first came in, all of a sudden he was on every TV show, which is not good for an attraction guy. So, uh, but that was not a good outing. And, uh, I applaud Kane for being so professional Conrad. He knew what he was in for. Yes, he did. He, he knew the match wasn't going to be good and he couldn't make it good. No matter how hard he worked or how smart he worked. So, but that was, uh, it was almost a let me up type match that five minutes following the, uh, the ladder, the, uh, ladder match was, it needed something, to, a breath of fresh air let me up as Vince would say. And so we let him up with a Kali and Kane. Chris Benoit is going to beat MVP to retain the U S title in nine minutes and 19 seconds. Meltzer said it was a good match, but it could have been longer. And he also says, quote, the story here was that MVP was hanging with Benoit when it came to Matt wrestling. Benoit won with three German suplexes and a diving headbutt for the pin. for years. I've thought Benoit needed to score some pins with the diving headbutt to gel the move or to get the move over as a uh, potential finisher. Unfortunately, by never winning with the move, people were expecting a kick out yeah. three and a quarter stars. Unfortunately, this is the last year that we would see Chris Benoit at WrestleMania. And meanwhile, 15 years later, MVP is one of the top managers in the game. Uh, did you think there was a bigger ceiling for MVP at this point? Yeah, I, I was kind of teetering. I, uh, he had a great look and he had a a real good aptitude for the business, a lot of personality. So yeah, I thought that he had a good upside. Uh, he had a good gimmick, as I say, good, good TV persona. Uh, but you know, let's not mistake things. He wasn't in Benoit's league. You know, he had a good match MVP and he deserved the bookie. He'd been through a hell of a lot. You know, guys have been incarcerated for as long as he was back in the day to battle his way out of prison. And then, uh, uh, and then finally, and then find himself, get his career going. And then here, all of a sudden he's at WrestleMania was an amazing accomplishment. And uh, one of which uh, MVP should be very proud and his friends and family should be very proud. But, uh, I, uh, so I'm not saying this in any disrespect to, uh, uh, Montel Wontavious Porter. <laughs> that was another thing we could figure out what to call him. So MVP became the name. I wasn't big on those three name deals, man. I have a hard enough time with one. So, uh, but Ben Wall is a special talent and I understand, you know, we don't talk about him because of the way he left the earth and yeah. the, his actions of the end of his life. And, uh, but as far as we're just talking wrestling here, just rep bell to bell, Ben Wall is about as good as it gets closest thing to Chris Ben Wall today, bell to bell is, uh, uh, Brian Danielson. Yep. I agree. I was going to say the same thing. Let's get to our, uh, was it a main event undertaker and Batista for the world title? They get 15 minutes and 47 seconds. And Meltzer says this match had the most heat of anything on the show. 
the last few months of the undertaker push has made him the most popular character in the promotion. Even though John Cena is the one who carries the business and that he draws the new fans, sells tickets and merch. Even in the late nineties run with Austin, I don't think the undertaker has ever been as over as he is right now. Uh, they had a poll and 82% of the audience thought undertaker was going to win. JBL kept going on and on about how undertaker streak was not only the greatest streak in sports entertainment, but sports in general. The big surprise here was that the match, the match wasn't good because they were going all out, but how fast paced it was. These are two guys, both probably 280 pounds or more. And it wasn't as if they just kept it going. They were going fast. Batista power slammed undertaker through the ECW announce table. What a shame given that Joey styles and Taz only had one match to call and it hadn't happened yet. They traded near falls with the undertaker doing a power bomb out of the corner. Batista doing a spine buster and undertaker doing a choke slam. Batista used a spear and a Batista bomb for near falls. And the crowd was into those near falls strong undertaker finally put him away with the tombstone and he gave it four stars. So maybe folks didn't expect it to be a great match. Maybe they didn't expect it to be this fast, but boy, the crowd is up for this one. It almost feels like undertaker and Batista were out to, uh, prove something here. Had a little think, on yeah, over. yeah, they were out. To, they did it too. Uh, the pace of the match is what made it. Yes. But we were all thinking it was going to be a deliberate pace match for two heavyweight guys that had, you know, that didn't, that sh- they had, that we knew they had the other gear, but you know, it, they were not put in positions uh, that regularly to expose that other gear. So I think the pace was the difference in that, in that matchup. And those guys, I think, again, they wanted to go on last and they didn't get that opportunity, but they delivered like they were going on last and then kind of had that attitude, like follow this voice, see what you got, see what you got in your tank. And, uh, so it was a pleasant surprise, but not one that I was shocked about. Both guys could do it. And they just brought a little bit extra, especially again, in that pace, yeah. uh, the speed of the match, they brought a little bit extra Conrad and it, uh, it, it, it made the difference in that presentation. It, it is really a phenomenal match. I recommend that you go out of your way to see it. Of course, we know we're going to see Sean and uh, John Cena try to steal the show later in the day. But for me, I think this is just as good as anything else on the show. Uh, to recap, uh, match one got four and a quarter stars with the money in the bank. Unbelievable. The next one, Kali and Kane, negative one star. Ben Juan MVP, three and a quarter. And here, a four star match. And now, it's time for our ECW match. Mm-hmm. Rob Van Dam and Sabu and Tommy Dreamer and Sandman, the originals, take on Elijah Burke, Marcus Corvon, Kevin Thorne, and Matt Stryker. Uh, the live crowd treated it like intermission. They're completely dead. And Meltzer would say you can't fault the guys, and they had a good match given the limitations of time, and they're put in a position to not get over as the come down after a main event. The heels got heat on dreamer. RVD made a comeback. Sabu did a flip dive and, and dreamer did a, a DDT on striker. Everyone brawled on the floor except Van Dam and striker and Van Dam hit the frog splash for the win. Joey Stells kept putting over what a big deal. It was that ECW was a part of WrestleMania two and a quarter stars. I mean, I, I get, we're trying to get guys their big WrestleMania payday, but Rob Van Dam in a six minute match. With all these other talents, eh, maybe he could have did a little bigger. He's a star of the match. For sure. He's, he's the one that folks wanted to see mo- most of all. But again, uh, they, they, that was great exposure for the ECW brand to be uh, fe- featured on WrestleMania, but uh, it's hard to get established in six minutes. And I, I'm sitting here, and this is going to expose my uh, memory loss. I don't remember who Marcus Corvon was. Yeah, you do. He was in TNA. He did the pounce. Uh, Monty Brown was his TNA name. Oh, okay. I remember Monty Brown. Yeah. So he was Marcus Corvon. Yeah. For a cup Love of it. coffee. I mean, he's really one of the great. What ifs. Yeah. I got you. Got you. Well, thanks. Next up. It's the match. Everybody really tuned in for it's Bobby Lashley and Umaga. It's got Donald Trump's hair on the line with Vince McMahon's hair on the line. Trump's actually going to get physical here. And Meltzer would say for two guys and by far the biggest match of their careers, I was disappointed. 
I don't think Lashley's ready to hang to the level of his push, even though they couldn't be booking him stronger. He clearly has the athletic ability and a look that can't be beat. Whether or not he'll ever have the charisma is up in the air, but I sense right. it's more being rushed. That's the problem more so than they're hitching their train to the wrong wagon. But Trump came out, they dropped money from the ceiling again. And then Shane McMahon came out. Umaga was beating on Lashley in the corner and Austin pulled Umaga off by pretending to hook him in the eye. Umaga jumped Austin and eventually laid him out with the Samoan spike. Shane and Umaga then beat up on Lashley. Vince threw in a trash can. They put the garbage can in front of Lashley's face and Shane did the coast to coast drop kick. Shane took off his shirt and revealed a referee shirt. Umaga used a splash off the top. Shane went to count the fall, but at the count of two, Austin pulled Shane out. Austin threw Shane out of the ring. Trump went to the other side and gave Vince a clothesline. And while on the ground, Trump threw some shots and didn't pull them very well. Later that night, Vince's eye was swelling up. Although with makeup, he didn't look bad on TV the next night. Umaga then went for another Samoan spike on Austin. Austin ducked it and hit the stunner. Lashley hit the spear on Umaga and Austin counted the pin. So Vince runs off. Lashley sprints after him. They bring him back to the ring, put him in the barber chair. Somewhere in here, Austin gave Vince a stunner. Trump and Lashley shaved Vince's head. And they do all the stuff from the old days, like showing Vince his bald head in the mirror. And after it's over, Austin gives Trump a stunner and Trump's selling was so bad. He made Linda McMahon look like a great wrestler. Mm. Quite a spectacle, a lot going on here. Bruce has told us before they weren't exactly sure that Vince McMahon, or I'm sorry, Donald Trump knew how to throw a punch. Yeah. So Bruce showed him how to throw a punch and <laughs> Michael Hayes laid out to Trump. Here's what we want you to do. But he used wrestler speak like you're going to go over and King, King, King. And so then <laughs> apparently Trump came to Bruce and says, what is King, King, King. And they eventually meet with Vince and Vince just says, Donald, just hit me in the face as hard as you can. There you go. And well, you don't want me to do that. Yes, that'll be fine. Hit me as hard as you can in the face. The idea being, we don't get another chance to make this look good. And you don't want him to go out here and play wrestler. Right. So Vince just took his lumps rather than it look like shit and get replayed everywhere. Punch Vince. He'll take the lump, put a little makeup on it the next day and be fine. Right. Pretty well, cool. Yeah. It's uh, interesting to see how that, that the Bruce, uh, and, uh, Michael Hayes, hey, you got two good guys trying to lay the thing out, but you got to. You got to break it down into the language that the, the participants can understand. And of course, Trump didn't know any of the inside terms, uh, to the shock of good old Michael PS Hayes. Everybody wasn't a, a student or, or aficionado of pro wrestling as, uh, many of us are and were, uh, so, uh, I, I thought, I just, I don't know, Conrad, I, I thought that whole thing, considering all the moving parts, uh, Lashley wasn't ready. Umaga was Austin added to the story. Yeah. Uh, Vince is not Luthes, uh, but he did, he did great. There are a lot of moving parts that had to be synchronized. And that's what you, I I've always been proud of in some of these situations I've been fortunate to be a part of is to see these multiple individual matches that have all these different, uh, appendages do, uh, uh, do so well because they guys, they, they broke it down to where they they could understand and, and their skill sets were, were commensurate with, uh, with what they were asked to do. But I remember Trump throwing those punches and, you know, they weren't going to hurt anybody, No, but he, but he, he wasn't throwing a working punch because he didn't know how to throw a working punch. That's another thing. People go back and watch the show. These little nuances we point out now, you might enjoy the show more, or I'm sure some of our younger viewers and listeners have not seen it. They sure didn't see it live because of their age, a lot of them. So check that out. And those, some of those little things like that are, are pretty good. And, uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure what four stars, three and a half, something like that. I, I love you for that. He gave it three stars, three, whatever. So, you know. Well, that's what it was, buddy. And, and, and people are waiting on the haircut. They didn't give a shit about a hurricane run or a tope el suicida or a, uh, you know, chili, no. con, chili con carne. They wanted 
the haircut. Right. Everything was about somebody getting their head shaved. And, uh, to the wrestling fan, the emotional investment, I think they'd rather seen as much as the heel as Vince was. And he was a great one. Uh, I think that they were probably wanting to see Trump get his head shaved more than Vince because of the mystery hair. The thing about that, Trump did all that shit and his hair hardly ever moved. Uh, I saw a shot somewhere along the way where it started, it was laying down like this. Then it, it started going up, up to where he had like a fro, a faux, uh, uh, bohawk. It went boom. His hair went up. Uh, but I never was, I tried to get around and get a look at that hair. I, I never could. He's pretty uh, protective of the hair. He's like Mil Mascaris in his mask. He'd wear his mask in the shower with the boys. Uh, but Trump protected that hair big time. Still does. It's pretty surreal to see the future president of the United States involved here, but here he <laughs> is. Uh, next up, it's the ladies. Melina's going to pin Ashley to keep the women's title in a lumber Jills match. They go three minutes, go. 13 seconds. Uh, Meltzer would say the women at ringside was just an excuse for them to, uh, all dress up. Melina did a giant swing after Ash Ashley missed an elbow drop. Melina pinned her with the rolling reverse cradle, holding the tights. All the women hit the ring and fought. And Ashley looked like an amateur out there. Women's wrestling's come a long way, but this one got a dud match. But after what we just saw, this is in the dreaded, let me up position. Is it not correct? Exactly. And, uh, you know, you wish it for the lady's sake. Uh, it would have been better, uh, come off better. But again, Ashley wasn't ready. God bless her. Uh, Melina was underrated a lot. She's still working. I know she's working some, she works some indie shows and things like that. Uh, she was always a sweetheart to work with and, uh, you know, her, but she lost a lot of, she had a hard time overcoming her entrance when she came to the ring and did that split on the apron. It's like, okay, that's what I want to see. <laughs> so it's just uh, interesting. What catches, what, uh, what people attach their fandom to, but she was, uh, she was good. I, I always thought that she was a little bit underappreciated in speaking of Melina. Now it's time for our main event. John Cena is going to beat Shawn Michaels in 28 minutes and 20 seconds to keep the title. John Cena has the most elaborate entrance on the whole show. Uh, he's driving a Ford Mustang around the streets, turning fast corners, driving through the glass staging out in front of people. Of course, Meltzer can't wait to remind us that this was pre-taped before the show started and probably wasn't <laughs> seen a driving except the final segment. Duh. Uh, you know, I'm not so sure about that. I think that John did some of the driving cause he was a kind of a car guy, but, uh, yeah, Dave, good old Dave would make sure we know that that was pre-taped and wasn't done live. Why do we need to know that? Is it important to know that Conrad? I, am I, am I, overlooking? Tell you, I don't know. Is it, did it make, did it make or break you either way? No, I mean, I, I can't imagine that this is actually happening right outside of the arena. You know, we got a fucking show to do. Uh, so yep. yes, of course it was pre-taped. Yeah. Uh, Meltzer says the unscripted moment of the show was when a British fan hit the ring. My Kyoto grabbed a front face lock in the ring. Kyoto wanted the match to start, but Michael sat on the top turnbuckle and wasn't going until the guy was gone. The crowd was brutal to Cena. He was booed far more than anyone else in the show. From all accounts, it was much louder live than even it appeared on TV to the point where kids were booing him. Now the company knew ahead of time, they played his music super loud. So you couldn't hear the initial crowd reaction, but apparently dialed it back during the match because they went so long. They started slow. Michaels did a five knuckle shuffle, but accidentally super kicked Kyoto, but the referee down Cena goes for the FU Michaels counters, but it's a botched DDT. No ref to count the pin. Michaels gives Cena a pile driver on the ring steps and cut the back of Cena's head. Michaels had Cena down when referee Jack Doan ran in, but of course Cena kicked out. And then there was one excellent exchange of moves and counters that pretty much made the match. The key spots were Michaels kicking out of an FU while Cena kicked out of a super kick. And in the end, Cena used an FT, uh, an FU and then got the STFU in the middle and Michaels tapped out after the match. Cena went to shake hands with Michaels, but Michaels walks away and the crowd is booing Cena's win a lot, but they're happy. They saw a strong main event. 
four stars. What say you, Jim? Liked it. I liked the match. Uh, I thought it might have been a little longer than we needed. Uh, 20, almost a half an hour. I'm not so sure those two talented men needed a half an hour to tell their story. Uh, but I didn't get bored. Uh, and, and I thought they did a really nice job. Good, good main event. Look, look what they followed. You know, you wrote, you went over some of those things they followed and the stars that were being doled out. Yeah. Uh, they followed everything hair, lumber, lumberjacks and money in I, the back. Yeah. All yeah. that stuff, man. So I thought it was good, Conrad. I thought they did a good job. And, uh, for those that say that Sean is not a team player. He tapped out in the middle of the ring at WrestleMania 23. And he did the same thing. You know, he he's made a lot of guys, but he really makes Cena look like a good worker here. I mean, prior to this, people weren't thinking that, that John was all that talented of an in-ring performer, but man, what a great show. That's how that shows you how good Michaels yes. was. He trumped uh, the number one guy in the company and it wasn't even close, uh, as to who the, the best worker. And I'm sure if John Cena were available right now to take a phone call from us, he'd tell you the same thing. I followed Sean. He made me better. He got our match over. And for that, I'm, I'm thankful. Let's do some questions here. A wrestling historian wants to know, had he not gotten injured, would Hunter Hearst Helmsley have won the rematch with John Cena here? I kind of think that was the plan, right? That triple H would beat him. Did you see that happening? I think so. I think so. It's been a long time to, to, to go back in my memory bank, but, uh, that seems to be logical quite frankly. And, uh, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that could have happened very plausibly. Uh, next up, we should talk about Mark's question. He says, I think Cena HBK is a top five mania main event. Uh, the storytelling was on a, a level few can reach. Does JR agree? Is this a top five main event for you? It's close. It's in the hunt. No doubt. Uh, uh, I'm, it's hard to say. Now I was listening to Mike Krzyzewski the other day, talk about, is this the best team he's ever coached? And he's got, he's had the, what is it? Like, uh, 17 teams go to the final four something like that. Something ridiculous. He says, I don't rate my, my, my children or my grandchildren. I love them all. Great answer. He said, plus, I don't want to piss off all the other teams by saying this team is better than them. And, uh, and I kind of think that same thing here, it's hard to pick one match. I've called as much of great WrestleMania main events, but if I was going to sit down and do a list, I will promise you that match would be on the list. Uh, Kurt wants to know if Kennedy would have uh, gotten the cash in the briefcase, instead of having to give it up due to injury, do you think he would have become a main event player or would his finish to his career with the company have probably been the same either way? Hard to say, really hard to say, uh, he was being, uh, put on the fast track. He had a lot of skill sets that Kennedy, uh, a lot of skills and a refined skill set. Uh, there was just something about his, uh, run there that was missing. And I'd have to really sit down and study it and go back and look at a lot of tape. Uh, but he was missing some element of his game, but, uh, on the surface, it looked like he was, uh, a made man. It just didn't work out for him. And that's unfortunate because I thought too, he was at one time he tried to be a little bit too stone cold. And I thought that was a mistake. Cause everybody could see instead, just be yourself, refine yourself in your own TV persona. I thought a little bit of uh, stone cold was coming out of him uh, and not, that was not flattering quite frankly, but he was a talented guy. Uh, Brad Stanton wants to know what was Trump like backstage? Is he a perfectionist? Well, I don't know. He's a perfectionist. He's going to protect his image. He, he was certainly that, uh, I had several conversations with him. Uh, and he kind of relied on me to give him, uh, translate some of the wrestle speak and I, and well, which I did best I could. Uh, but he, he seemed to me to be more interested in the divas than anything else on the show. Who's she now? What's that one? You know, I kind of think, uh, but I can't say that's a mistake. I mean, he's a healthy red blooded American man. And, uh. You know, maybe sometimes his little head thanks for his big head. Hell, I don't know. 
So, but he was, he was okay. Conrad, very, he was protective, you know, he was protective in that respect. Uh, his, but his son, one of my cameras, what it was, was really scary, dorky. And, uh, you know, his facial expressions and he's like, he was a secret service guy. He couldn't probably beat his way out of a paperback. But nonetheless, uh, I, I didn't have any real major issues with Trump. I had more issues with him as president as I did as a reformer at WrestleMania 23, but he was okay. You know, he was, he was in a new land and he's not used to being in new land. He's used to being the emperor of the new land. And, uh, you know, he was a different world. He was in Vince's world and he adapted and, uh, we did well. So here's one from Adam. He wants to know if Steve Austin wasn't available, who would Jr. have liked to have seen induct him into the hall of fame? Oh, wow. I don't know. Conrad, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, because I said earlier, I never really considered anybody else. So I didn't go to plan B and cause I knew that Steve would, would come through. And that was, I asked him about this. Uh, right after I found out I was going into the hall of fame. And I think that's before all that, uh, referee thing started and all that. Uh, I don't know, maybe Watts, maybe cowboy, you know, that would not have fit with Vince's, you know, it's not modern. So I went right to the top of the list. I, I had a foolproof induct inductor and, but, uh, maybe Watts I'm trying to think who else. In another, in another term and another, uh, you know, maybe, uh, at another time, I should say maybe Lawler, if Lawler and I weren't going in together, that might've been a, that might, that might've worked. Uh, I'm just trying to think who else I signed so many guys that, uh, you know, maybe somebody from that, that list would have, would have made it, but, but there was just, you know, I had knew what I wanted. I, I wanted stone cold. And he wanted to do it. So it seemed like that worked out pretty good, but boy, that's a good question. I don't, I had never even thought of that, but maybe cowboy because he was my mentor for so long, maybe Mick Foley. Cause I had a hard time hiring him, getting him hired. And he had such a great run there. He would have been great. Uh, Paul Heyman would have been good. We had some nice, we had a great run together in WCW and in, 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 in uh, WWE. So, uh, and he would have come through. But Austin was always the guy and, uh, thank God it worked out. Uh, here's one from uh, Lee Dyer, Jim, can you take us through your day of the hall of fame induction? Who came into town to celebrate with you? Any memorable meals in Detroit? I was uh, there for the hall of fame. I was lucky to be a part of that. Thank you, sir. Lee from Detroit. Um, uh, well, you know, it, it, the rules change when you travel with your wife and, uh, <laughs> As far as timelines and deadlines and you know, God bless her. I love her so much this very day, even though she's not with us anymore. Uh, I always, uh, gave, I lied to her a lot about what time we had to be somewhere. I always moved the clock because I didn't want any photo finishes. I couldn't handle it. <laughs> I was, you know, I got pretty, I, I got to give a speech. I'm going to the hall of fame. I'm going to broadcast a WrestleMania event, including the main event. Uh, so I had a lot on my mind, but I also wanted to have her to have a good time because there's as much about her as it was about me in my, in my world. Uh, but you know, you, there's never a dull moment. Every, it seemed like every hour was occupied with something, you know, pictures, uh, interviews, what have you. And I had show prep to do. I still had to go over my notes and write my notes out. We didn't have a producer that would hear, you know, we have Alex Marvez at AEW who does announcer notes for us, little biographical thumbnail sketches of the participants in our, in our ma matches on our individual shows. And for me, it's dynamite. I didn't have that there. And Alex is a, of course, not only been a talented, not only a talented writer, NFL guy and all that good stuff, an old, old time friend. Uh, uh, he, he was, a, he's, he's been a big help for all of the announcers, not just me, but, uh, you know, you, you got to find time for lunch with your wife. 
you know, if she wasn't there, I wouldn't even have lunch. So you got to find time with lunch for your wife. You got to find a nice dinner place. I'm trying to think where we went. And, uh, I think we might've gone to Greek town. You ever been to Greek town, Connie in uh, Detroit? No, it's pretty cool. Uh, great food. And that's why we went there. I remember taking Bob Cottle there too, one time. Uh, and we had a, he just was enamored with the food cause it was unique. It's different, authentic. So, uh, and then on the day of the event on Saturday, there they'll do a little walkthrough at the, at the venue. And I would, uh, Jan didn't participate in that, but she, you know, she would, she had a ride and they, they brought, they picked her up to the hotel and brought her over. I had my tux and all that, what I was going to wear to get inducted with. And she picked out. She always picked out the cummerbunds and the, and, and the ties and pocket squares and all that stuff. And, uh, but it's amazing. You know, we started talking about this, Connie, I can look, I can remember sitting here looking at her, where she was sitting and there she was crying, laughing, everything was cool. So, uh, it was a very important day in my career because it honored her as much as it honored me. And that's kind of what I you know, uh, worked, worked around, uh, uh, under the black hat had a Jan in it all through it. And then, you know, I, and when I write my next book, which is going to happen, we're going to call it JR 50 mm -hmm. and uh, it's going to hopefully come out in 2024, uh, whether I'm still in the wrestling business at that time or not, it didn't matter to me. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to finish the story. And, uh, I think it's going to be pretty cool writing about 50 different moments in my career that, 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 uh, were groundbreaking in some, for some reason, when you, when you, when you've been in the business long enough, Conrad, where you've gone through syndication, in other words, getting your, your TV show, your one hour TV show on a local station, all the way through the evolution of the media, digital pay-per-view, all, all these things, you know, shoot. Uh, so many changes that we're going to talk about there. So, uh, anyway, uh, that's another topic for another time, but, uh, it, that, that weekend will be covered and it was really cool. I just remember my friends drinking too much. God damn. And it's like I told Brett Favre one time quarterback, the old quarterback that played for the Packers or played for the uh, Falcons first, he and Bill Fralick, who's a great player and I were out drinking in Atlanta when I was doing Falcon games and wrestling and man, he was, Brett was hitting that crown Royal, like it was Snapple. And I said, man, I know you're a gamer, but no matter how hard you try Conrad, you cannot drink all the crown Royal in Atlanta, but, uh, he damn sure made an effort. Uh, so, uh, that was kind of like my buddies. I said, Jesus, does moderation not mean nothing. So, uh, but anyway, they had a great time. And when I see my, when I see my guys here in, in Norman, where I am now, there's hardly a, 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 a meeting goes by Connie that they don't talk about. It. That was a highlight for them. Seeing all these stars, they grew up watching their old buddy, Jr. getting inducted in the hall of fame. The same guy they drank with at happy hour when he's back home, just good, just Jr. He's just our guy and not a star, not a personality. Just he's Jr. And, uh, I know they had a great, great time with that. So uh, I I'm digressing from our story, but there's a lot to talk about as far as that weekend and what we did. But like I said, when you travel with your wife, who's a clothes horse, she's always going to make sure she, she's going to forget something. So she didn't go to the Louis Vuitton store <laughs> and, and, and compensate and, uh, you know, and who cared? I loved it. It's made her happy. Well, we hope we got that. We made you happy, uh, this week, and, and we're hoping to do it again next week. We're going to be talking about Vader, another guy joining you in the hall of fame. Of course, we hope you guys enjoy WrestleMania this weekend. We hope you'll check out a couple of websites too. For one adfreecares.com. We mentioned this last week. I want to remind you again, this year, Jim and I are donating all the proceeds from our t-shirt sales for our program here. 100% of them directly to St. Jude's children's hospital. Uh, if you've been keeping up with our t-shirts for the last few years, they've been 24 99. Now they're 17 99. 
100% of the proceeds, not $1 to Jim, not $1 to me. It all goes directly to St. Jude's. We're glad to be a part of that. I hope you'll take a look. Jeff Jarrett, Eric Bischoff, Tony Shivani, they're all joining us. We're all trying to raise money for St. Jude's. Adfreecares.com is where you can get that swag and make sure that you're giving back to a really, really great cause. But once you get that shirt and you get WrestleMania fired up, I recommend you fire up the grill and yes, it's sir. Be tasting good. As long as you went to jrsbbq.com. Yeah. Or my boy, Steven link, uh, who runs our site there. A lot of the fans are, have a relationship with cause Steven's very fan friendly and, uh, you know, customer service is a big deal to me and, and to him. He's had uh, bacterial pneumonia and uh, really in a rough spot. And he's finally, they put him into, uh, uh, he's now he's advanced to physical therapy, but boy, that's a, that's a tough, that was a tough hit, uh, for his family and for him. Uh, but we're still shifting the orders out. We got, we don't have the, we, we got a replacement for him for now. Uh, Steven's wife is helping us. I'm signing books like right, right and left. That's the cool thing about buying a book from JR's barbecue.com is like, there's an offer there where I'll personalize it to Conrad from your pal, JR. Uh, so, uh, it's been, this has been good. It's solid, but now's the time to stock up. And I, I like I say, if you got, a, we all got wrestling fans in our, in our lives. And I think that JR's barbecue.com offers a plethora of things that are cool gifts for, you know, the, for a birthday person or an anniversary or whatever, a thank you. So, uh, check it out. Don't cost nothing to look pretty cool deal. And, uh, I had a, I had a magnificent sandwich last night only because my refrigerator has plenty of, uh, mustard. There you go. Yeah. I don't even have any mayonnaise in my refrigerator anymore, which is, you, had, you told me that not that long ago. I said, you're crazy. I'm not going to do all that mayo. Well, I am, and it's healthier to eat my mustard. And that's what I'm trying to do is eat a little healthier. So I know you like it. And, and the seasoning is there so many different ways you can use it in a positive manner, good taste, whether it be your scrambled eggs or a big old steak or popcorn or anything in between. It's something for everybody. JRSBBQ.com. Thank you guys for tuning into our show today. Don't forget you get them all early and ad free at adfreeshows.com. And don't forget tomorrow night. 7 p.m. We're going to be right. in Dallas. It's Eric Bischoff, Jeff Jarrett, myself, William Regal, and I'll be darned Jeff Hardy. It's supershowlive.com. If you uh, may need to make plans, pick up tickets right now. But if you can't make it to Dallas, we understand. Uh, check us out on Fight, supershowlive.com. And uh, so it's going to be televised on Fight. Yeah, man. So that, see, that's, uh, I, I kind of went over my aged head. That's a cool deal, folks. F I T E. You can see it there. And that's a, that's a neat deal because everybody can't go to Dallas. Uh, but if you want to watch the proceedings and I guarantee you, there's going to be some monumental sound bites. and are you going to have alcohol there? Oh, of course, dude. Come well, on. never mind. Yeah. It's going to be crazy. <laughs> it's it's going to be fun. I wish I, I wish I was booked, but I am not. So Conrad, Conrad offered me the opportunity to be booked. I think it's the same. Don't totally bury me. You were invited. No, and, you were. Uh, I don't think you were allowed to, uh, you were, but circumstances that, are changing. Yeah, right. Well, at the time, uh, from a business side of things, I was just not made available. It yes. wasn't, wasn't going to work, but Conrad invited me like two or three times early yeah. on. And I wanted to go, I wanted to go do it. Uh, it just didn't work out. Now things have changed. The ground rules have somewhat changed. There's a lot of AEW talents that was going to be at WrestleCon and things like that. And you got Jeff going to be with Conrad on Friday night. So things have changed. That's just the ever business keeps evolving. So it's all good. It's all good. So check out Conrad and I'll, I can tell you this, I'll be back in Jacksonville for that, uh, on that date. And I will certainly be watching on the, on the fight app. I, I fight that's a pretty cool deal. And, uh, you know, I was one of the original stockholders in that company and helped launch it. I made a little money on my stock. So I'm a big fight guy. So I uh, hope you guys will check that out. That's a real cool element, Conrad, that you're going to be able to present to the fans. They won't miss anything. It's like picture in picture. You don't miss nothing, which I think is a sad commentary, but any, in any event, uh, 
check it out. I, that's, I think it's going to be a fun show. You get some, I don't, I don't think we need to get Jeff Hardy inebriated. I don't think that's a good idea, but Bischoff and the Eric will take up the slack. Are you drinking anymore? Are you oh, yeah. off? I'll be doing my thing. Eric will be doing his thing and we will still have extra left for you in case you decide to make a late, you know, late run, a, a, a run in. Yeah. You know, hot tag run in. I just, I got to win the belt though. So the strap, I need the goddamn strap Conrad. So I can get my push push is everything. It's all in the push. It's all good. Well, we're hoping you guys give us a push over at adfreeshows.com or supershowlive.com or adfreecares.com or jrsbbq.com. We're all dot com out, but we'll be back yeah. in time next week to talk all things Vader right here on Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. Thank you guys for joining us today. Thanks for supporting AEW. My, that's how I get paid and I, uh, I'm loving it. And we've been having some great TV shows, man, that talent roster at AEW just get deeper and deeper, but nonetheless, uh, we appreciate you guys tuning in to Conrad and I, we enjoy Conrad and I, this sometimes this is the only time we talk. Yeah. And so I enjoy the hell out of this. And sometimes we, I deviate and wander away from what we were talking about because <laughs> I got things I want to talk to Conrad about. So sure. it's all good, man. So life is good. And I appreciate everybody's support especially Conrad's and his team. They're the best. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next week. Thanks everybody. Enjoy WrestleMania. So long.